You will eat the bitter fruit of your own ways. You've made your own bed. Now lie in it. How do you like that? <laughs> like an idiot, you've turned away from me. And chosen destruction and said, did you notice that? Chosen destruction. See, there are people that think they'll get away with it. That's why you have serial killers and murderers and bank robbers and all these people. They think they'll get away with it. You, your self-satisfied smugness will kill you. That word smugness means abundant prosperity. See, all these people that are seeking to destroy our country and to destroy the image of God and people that worship Him, it's because of their abundant prosperity. Their money has gone to their head. They think they're gods. But the one who... All, now, this is important. This is what I want you to hear. The one who always listens to me, get this, will live in un disturbed in a heavenly peace, free from fear, confident and courageous, you will rest unafraid and sheltered from the storms of life. So it tells you if you're having a problem, we need to concentrate on. Where did you miss wisdom? Right? right? <laughs> but, oh my gosh, I'm just, my mind is blown away. I thought Christians are mostly under attack. Right? Oh, my kids ain't serving the Lord, and my health is, you know, oh, praise you, Jesus. So, He's teaching me to, you know, be humble and glory in my sufferings. Yeah, this is, I've heard this stuff. This is my thorn in the side, child. God, pray and pray and pray and pray. I'll be healed one day in heaven. I mean, seriously, the, I'm mocking it, but this is what people believe in the church because God's sovereign and He's in control. Well, my Bible says the one who always, always is a key word, listen to me, will live undisturbed in the heavenly peace. Please. Peace. Free from fear. You don't have to fear. You don't have to fear car wrecks. You don't have to fear your house burning down. You don't have to fear it being broken into. Because you know why? Wisdom will say, hey, you didn't lock your door. You need to turn back and lock the door. Hey, that car that's been driving by several times, go out there and mad dog them. Hey, like whatever it is, he'll tell you, hey, quit eating this. Start eating that. Go for walks. Do the he's, he's, Wisdom is crying out for us. And then, free from fear, blah, 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 you will rest unafraid, sheltered from the storms of life. Okay, what does this mean? You're living above the snake line. That's what it means. You're living above the snake line. It is a supernatural natural. That's what it is. It's where his super meets your natural. His super is you've already been healed. Natural, hey, take vitamin D so you're not getting sick all the time. His super is divine protection, yet his natural is, hey, maybe you should go this direction today, not that direction, because who knows, there might be a wreck that would take you out. You see what I mean? Hey. His supernatural, yes, I will protect you on your travels, but hey, you shouldn't take this trip right now. You see what I mean? It's very practical to follow the Lord and listen to wisdom, and wisdom's never based in a fear of what might happen. So that's not wisdom, by the way. Well, and I don't this, even know how I got on and this. And right here where it says he was not their prisoner, <laughs> they, were, this, they were his. Mm. You know what? That's just a whole, that opens up just a big, because... A lot of Christians see Jesus as the victim of the cross, the victim of the Romans, the victim of the Jewish, the Sadducees and the Pharisees, right. the council. He was the victim. And it says right here, he was not their prisoner. Nope. That he, that they were his prisoner, they were doing what he, A hook his in their plan, nose. Mm -hmm, they were just fulfilling what he had already decided to and do. And the <clears throat> reason they became a hook and uh, uh, a the reason they were able to be hooked <laughs> is because their hearts of unbelief. Right. Like if you look at the Pharaoh, so on the Pharaoh, you know, it says that God hardened his heart and God did this and blah, blah. If you look in the original language, what it means is that his heart was already hard and God used it to his advantage to get his people free. But people, So the I condition think, of your heart, right. Judas wasn't a victim. <laughs> right. Judas refused to hear what the Spirit was saying through Jesus Christ. And he betrayed him, not because it was some sovereign, he was elected by God to be an idiot. That wasn't the case. 
his heart was fully susceptible to the enemy coming into him. He's one of the few that the, the devil guys, yeah. Satan, entered his heart. Now that's a interesting deal. And so it's it always comes back to our choices. Mm -hmm. and, but I think it's a perception right here for Christians. Yeah. If you don't see Jesus as the conqueror, right, and as the you know the the one that is the overcomer, mm -hmm. then you're going to see him as the victim, and then and you're, if you're a victim. portraying yourself as <clears throat> Jesus. Mm -hmm. You're going to play the victim. You know, I've had it with uh, two types of Christians, fake ones, and then uh, victims. The only reason, as a Christian, that we become a victim is we believe a lie. You can walk out of it. I was telling a guy, you know, we've all had hard things. We've all, uh, I was telling, I had uh, two or three bouts of depression when I was young. Uh, anxiety that was crippling at times. And uh, I told him, I said, but you know what was funny? <laughs> Is one time after six weeks of tormenting myself, I was like, Lord, I can't live this way anymore. You know how we do. Make sure we have a mirror so we can see how, you know, sad and depressed we are. <laughs> And the Lord said, you can stop it right now by choosing to trust me and believe what I say. Uh -huh. I was all, oh, I can? Uh-huh, yeah, you can just walk right out of that fear right now. Huh. Okay, so I did. I made a decision, walked right out of it, fast forward, right after that, the whole situation changed. I was driving over to Overpass uh, by Brady and, you know, North Prince or South North South Prince uh, coming Wall over Street. the overpass. Yeah, well, not Hall. I was over on Prince, but um, by Mike's shop, the overpass by Mike's shop. Mm -hmm. And I all of a sudden I had this revelation. I said, "Hey, Lord, um, about the whole trial we just went through." He's like, "Yeah, it could have been shortened." <laughs> <laughs> and all of a sudden I had a revelation. That six weeks was my fault. It didn't have to last six weeks. The moment I chose to believe was the moment we, we walked out of that circumstance, right? I've had it several times. So sometimes we are without help. We're not sure what to do. And the Lord has to maybe give us a prophetic word or something to help us out because we don't see a scrapbook of scoundrels, whatever it is, so we can get out of the current situation we're in. But there's the other side of it is that we are choosing at times to be victims we are choosing at times to stay in a situation where we can literally turn off the switch and walk out of that room lock the door behind us and never enter again god gave me a uh, just a phrase and it was a, a, a hot house christian you know when you have orchids and when you try to cultivate they're very finicky they have mm -hmm. to have their you know you take them out of the rainforest where, and then they have to be put into a greenhouse and you know or sprayed and misted and watered a certain way and fed a certain way and and if you get out of that perfect environment then they die and wilt I mean that to me describes a lot of Christianity in this country yes. right now and probably in a lot of the Western Hemisphere of when you go to church you're in that environment yeah and then when you get out it's like no change yeah no change <laughs> Oh goodness, we got, we got to get this because we're wasting time. So he stripped them of every weapon, spiritual authority, power to accuse us. By the power of the cross, Jesus led them as prisoners in a procession of triumph. He was not their prisoner; they were his. Like Chris, Christy, good grief, Kathy was saying. That's my sister. <laughs> now I can't help but think of the Nephilim in this. You know, and I've taught about it. But just think, here are, you know you got the giants, part human, part angel. And they were counterfeit. See, the, the enemy always sends a counterfeit, guys. Always, always, always. He always does that. If you'll learn that one thing, you'll be able to spot the fake spouse, the fake job, the fake whatever, fake friend, fake, fake whatever, because the enemy always does that. Well, same thing. The giants, to pollute the bloodline, I mean, there's many aspects to that story, but here's the other thing. They were a counterfeit of who we are now as superhuman. We are superhuman. And a lot of people in the church don't even realize that when we're in Christ Jesus. 
So we know that the incident on Mount Hermon where the decision was made for the Watcher Angels to sleep with human women is where unprecedented evil was unleashed in the world. In fact, to the Jews, that was the biggest problem, even over Adam. It accelerated evil to such a degree that only, degree that only Noah and his family were salvageable. And finally, Jesus went to the base of Mount Hermon where P Peter confessed that he was the Christ and Jesus drew a line in the sand saying, that the gates of hell will not prevail against my ecclesia. Guess who he was talking to? The principalities and powers. He picked a fight. He went to heaven and sat down and said, Tag, y'all are it. <laughs> yeah. And he didn't do like Obama and say, here's the line in the sand. Right, kept he moving. never enforced. <laughs> now you might say, well, that's not very nice, Jesus. You pick a fight with them and then you say, okay, guys, make them my footstool. <laughs> But he has more faith in us and sometimes we have. Why? Because he knows that Jesus Christ is in us. Okay? So, here's the key for you to get. Jesus stripped away every weapon and all their spiritual authority and power to accuse you by canceling out every legal violation by fulfilling the law in our place and taking the punishment due us according to the law. Then, by his death, he canceled out the old covenant and instituted the new. Canceled the old. That is so important. Therefore, if a believer, Christ follower, tries to live under the law versus grace in Christ, they rearm <coughs> principalities and powers and restore their authority and power to accuse. Yeah. 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 It's stupid. Love, not law, freed us from the power of the kingdom of darkness and Nephilim dominion. And he showed us what a kingdom system looks like. He became an example for us, a model of who we are now. Superhuman, God-man, king-priest. Uh, and here's, you know, here's a mother's, let me just throw in a mother's name thought, because it is mother's name. Probably should do this. He prophesied to the first mother that through your seed, he was going to accomplish all of this. God has and an uncanny ability to take, I think I said this Friday, to take the very source of the failure and include them in the story of redemption. Mm -hmm. Every one of your woundings healed is your anointing. Okay? So that's what's incredible. As mothers, as women who were deceived, right? Eve was deceived. All right. He then said, through a woman the seed will come, who will crush the devil's head. So that's why the enemy loves abortion so much. Using mothers to kill their own in the womb. The safest place that it should be. Now, I know that just took a horrible turn for Mother's Day. But mothers need to wake up to the fact that they are being used to sacrifice their children to convenience, to sin, and all of that stuff. And that will never be Christian. I don't care what Catholics for abortion people say or progressive Christians say or whatever it is. That will never be a Christian practice ever. Well, and I think we're talking about this identity. I think women that are pregnant, they don't feel like they're a mother until they actually give birth. They don't realize they're a mother from the time of that conception. Yes. And Forever change their identity. So yeah. you can either be, you know. For your child or not. Right, a murdering mother mm -hmm. or a nurturing mother. Mm -hmm. We probably should get off that, you know, yeah. subject because it might ruin someone's Mother's Day. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, now, in <laughs> Ephesians 4, 11 through 13, the English Standard, which, of course, I understand fear and blah, blah, I, you know, when you're, you get pregnant. I mean, I understand that, but I don't understand killing off your baby because you, you know, you think that's a good idea. Because it's inconvenient, mostly. And he gave the apostles and prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God. So that's the, the purpose of the fivefold ministry. Uh, yeah, ministry. Did I say ministry? Anyway. To mature manhood to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Jesus Christ. So the only standard of who we are to look like is Jesus Christ. Everything from his character, how he thought, how he ministered, how he addressed issues like missing his ride so he just walked on water, how he navigated through persecution, the miracles he did, everything. There's so much more to the work he did than simply bringing a sacrifice. Okay, that was his priestly duty. 
And Paul knew it, but again, he's attempting to show the Hebrews how silly it would be to return to a system that's inferior and cannot make one righteous. He's a catalyst of a better covenant. Okay, so G's looking to see how much is left, so let's finish up. <laughs> For if that first covenant had been faultless, no one would have needed a second one to replace it, but God revealed the defect and limitation of the first when he said to his people, Look, the day will come, declares the Lord, when I will satisfy the people of Israel and Judah by giving them a new covenant. It will be an entirely different covenant than the one I made with their fathers. Did y'all notice that? Entirely different. When I led them by my hand out of Egypt, for they did not remain faithful to my covenant, so I rejected them, says the Lord. Now, real quick, the verse, uh, verse 7, the Greek for, for finding fault with it, he says to them, meaning that the law could never produce the God-man. That's what that's referring to. Okay, It's not anything else but that because man had to be born again due to sin-tainted blood. So his nature was fallen. He couldn't keep the law. It was impossible. So again, he saw our helplessness in the ability to redeem ourselves and make ourselves perfect morally. And then in uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 56, it says that the law actually strengthens sin. It's a supernatural power. So I'm more inclined to see that the fault is with us because of the fallen nature and all pre-saved people where the law was perfect. Right? So the law was perfect. We had the sin nature. That's why it couldn't uh, uh, save us. Well, Anita, we've talked about when you focus in on the sin, you're more likely to sin. And to me, that's what the law did also. It did. It focused in on your sin. It, it reminded every, them every year on the Day of Atonement. Right. Every, you know, every year they were reminded of how they were sinners. Yeah. But the main point I want you to get is that Paul wrote this during the time of the Law of Moses. So he's saying that's it. <coughs> it's passing away. It's in the process of dying. That's some of the Greek. And we can see that he was directly addressing the Law of Moses and the covenant established after they left Egypt. So what does this mean? Read my lips. No Christian is supposed to follow the law of Moses under any circumstance. Verse 10. <laughs> For here is a covenant, this is God speaking, that I will one day establish with the people of Israel. I will embed my laws within their thoughts and fasten them onto their hearts. <gasps> I thought we're not supposed to follow the law. Give me a second. <laughs> I will be their loyal God. They will be my loyal people. And the result of this will be that everyone will know me as Lord. There will be no need at all to teach their fellow citizens or brothers saying you should know the Lord Jehovah. Since everyone will know me inwardly. So he takes an external system and he focuses on the inward change. From the most unlikely to the most distinguished. For I will demonstrate my mercy to them and will forgive their evil deeds and never remember again their sins. Okay, now... He's going to put his law in our hearts and minds. Doesn't that refer to the law of Moses? Okay, no, because, and here's why. If you look up the original word there, absolutely it can refer to the law of Moses. But Jesus, what did he do? He reduced them to two, right? right. Mm -hmm. You follow love, you won't violate anything mm -hmm. in the Torah. So he also freed us from a lot of the laws there, like the food laws. You know, according to Mark 7 and, and other ones. Okay, now, I'm going to read to you uh, Romans 13, 8 through 10 in the Passion. Don't owe anyone anything except your outstanding debt to continually love one another. For the one who learns to love, here it is, has fulfilled every requirement of the law. Now, have you all ever met people that say they're Christian and they're under the law, are they very loving? Mm. I haven't met one yet. Yeah. That should be a clue right there. For the commandments, do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not covet, and every other commandment can be summed up in these words. Love and value others the same way you love and value yourself. See, here's the thing. If you don't value others but you value yourself, you know what you are? A narcissist. 
If you don't value yourself but love others, guess what you are? An enabler. You have to love God first, love yourself, and then others. Now, love makes it impossible to harm another. So love fulfills all that the law requires. Again, he says it again. Okay, love is what he writes on our hearts and minds. Uh, Romans 5.5 5 is scriptural proof for that. But here's an interesting fact. The word agape didn't exist until the writing of the New Testament. It's a noun verb that they created because there was no word for God love. So they made it. Notice that the outward things of washings and food issues, etc. were not on Paul's mind nor mentioned. Why? Because those things were number one, prophetic of the complete work Christ was going to do, but also for the protection of the Israelites and to reinforce the need to approach God His way. Now get this, the word sin is to miss the mark, right? It's also to miss the way life is supposed to be. Okay, well, let's take let's take that to its full thought. Are you supposed to be sick? No. There's a mark that's been missed. You're supposed to be poor? No. There's a mark that's been missed. You see what I mean? Now we're getting back to wisdom and doing what we're supposed to do. Isn't that interesting? So I don't want to just reduce it to adultery, reduce it to anger, things like that. It's like if you're not living a hundred percent in the reality of how Jesus Christ lived on the earth, which I think is all of us here, we're not yet at that place, right? Then the work of salvation is getting in the Word and I shouldn't be poor. I shouldn't be sick. I should have soul peace. My relationships should be healthy. All of those great things. And if I miss my ride, then I may have to walk across the sea. I don't know. But the reality is that our life should look like Jesus Christ. So, all of those things were never meant to be carried unto, uh, or into the new covenant. And the final verse in chapter 8, this proves that by establishing this new covenant, the first is now obsolete, ready to expire, and about to disappear. And guess what? It did in A.D. 70. The fact that God said He was going to replace the old with the new reveals the defect and limitation of the first. God wanted a new covenant without defect that could only come through God becoming man so we could become god men. When Jesus completed His work, He established the new covenant making it obsolete. Obsolete means abrogate, which I had no idea what that means, so I looked it up. It's to abolish by formal or official means, annul by an authoritative act, repeal. Now, we couldn't get Obamacare repealed, but God repealed the law. <gasps> I mean, I can just hear people, <laughs> oh my God, this is heresy. No, because he condensed it, distilled it down to two. Okay, when people who say, that they are Christ followers instead are law followers. They're trying to li live under a law and a covenant that has been annulled and no longer exists. But what does Paul mean when he says it's becoming obsolete, uh, obsolete growing old is ready to vanish away? Well, that would you know happen in AD 70 where the Romans destroyed the temple and for 2,000 years the Jews were scattered. Just think, those listening to me that feel you must keep the Old Testament laws, you need to hear this. What sense does it make to pursue the law and an old system that Jesus replaced with his new covenant when the best, let's say, use of your time is to pursue love? That'd be like, let's say that, you know, me and Mike met years ago and he's a con artist after my money. <laughs> it's terrible. And I find out, and within a certain amount of time, I get the marriage annulled. What kind of idiot am I if I continue to stay with the con artist that's trying to take my money? You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. The law was perfect because it came from the heart of God, yet it was incomplete in transforming the internal nature of man to be like God. Therefore, he annulled all of that and established a new covenant. So what sense does it make to keep trying to date your ex when you could just embrace your bridegroom. That's what it's summed up in 
and in fact, Romans, if I'm not mistaken, actually goes into that in that type of language. So it just doesn't make any sense. Well, and you get some of the, uh, I won't say cult, I'll say sex. Sex, S E C. I was about to say, wow, I'm making it real right here. <laughs> well, yeah, but you know, we're talking about like, <laughs> like the Amish, where they are still <laughs> back in the old whatever. And you, that you risk by still living back, like you're living back in those days, to be irrelevant right. in today's <clears throat> world. And the Holy Spirit's invading them spiritual, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. in, to be not uh, spiritually relevant. Right. Well, and... You because know, you're still living like you were living... Well, one of the things that um, when I was studying how the Constitution, all that happened uh, in a great book, I was really aggravated because a lot of what all happened was because the founding fathers saw religion on an extreme. And we have to start understanding that the way we believe and what we say will have a negative or a positive impact on culture in a profound way. And even though during that time I, I mean, we've talked about it. People were beaten, thrown in prison, some died. If you tried to preach without a license, forget it. You might find yourself dead, right? And so James Madison, John Adams, George Washington, and uh, Thomas Jefferson, all of them saw this and were even raised in those types of religions, the Puritans, you know, the Protestants, all that stuff. And they wanted nothing to do with it. And they saw the danger of state-controlled religion even here in America. And so then later, they made the 14th Amendment. No state will make a law. The Founding Fathers didn't include that in there because they were afraid. They, they wanted to leave religious freedom to state rights. They didn't want to go all into that. If you as a state wanted God in your courtroom, you could have it. But the federal, national government would have no say-so in that. They, as a national government, cannot tell you how to worship God, right? And then they passed the 14th Amendment, and now we've lost prayer in schools and God in courtrooms and the Ten Commandments and the you know, Christian symbolism on government property and all that stuff. And it was all because of the picture of religion that these men had. And so then you have today where we see this same thought happening where Christians think we should vote, vote pastors into office. What is that? We want a national state and national based religious person in office to legislate morals. Mm -hmm. Here's the thing, guys. If you are truly living like Jesus Christ, we will become the most attractive mm -hmm. religion out there that people will flock to. Remember that uh, youth meeting we had where it's like, how do we get the kids here? And how do we blah, 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 blah? And I'm all. Yes, Sherry? Uh, get Holy Spirit here, and they will come. Well, how do we get Holy Spirit here? <laughs> yeah. Worship. You know, it was like, you know, oh, and that's what did we do. We shifted everything to worship, and all of a sudden the kids are healing broken bones and doing this and doing that, and we're like 150 kids, gangbangers as people there. You know, we had to have bouncers and stuff. It wasn't pretty. Some of it was messy. But all of a sudden, Holy Spirit's showing up, so much so that religious people shut it down. Scared, man. Scared. So that's the thing. You carry Holy Spirit and you heal the sick. You give people hope. You impart peace. You're like, do you want to feel God? Right? Now all of a sudden we're more attractive than Islam, progressivism, all of that other stuff because he is the beauty that nations long for. Mm -hmm. Right? But he, people are not interested in religion. They're not interested in victim, victimhood and Christianity. They're not uh, uh, you know, looking for any religion and legalism that tells them do this and don't do that. They want the relationship. And if we give it to them, we can take this nation back. And not through governmental means. I could care less. I would rather have Donald Trump that pisses everybody off than a fake Christian like Biden is. Right? And Pelosi. Let's, we, should, we, we should care for the poor. We should... Well, you know, that's what she does. Right? 
And it's ridiculous. <laughs> what we need to do is empower people to no longer be poor, and then we can change a state and change a nation from one of poverty to one of uh, uh, prosperity. Well, and it's one thing to get up and say this is what we need to do, and then have in your own state the highest amount of homeless living on the streets that of anybody in America. Right. So it starts on your own front step. Let's just put it that way. Amen. Let's pray for our time and then go have some good Mother's Day food. Father, we thank you so much for your goodness. We thank you that you saw our inability to save ourselves, to make ourselves morally perfect. And until the time that Jesus Christ came, you instituted a nation. You gave them laws to protect them, to also govern them and to preserve their identity so that out of their own would come God in the flesh who would fulfill all the requirements of the law, including the punishment. He became a curse for us to free us from any curse. So we thank you for that. We thank you that because of Jesus Christ and his blood, we're now innocent and a curse without a cause cannot align. And we can live above the snake line. We can live in undisturbed heavenly peace. We can be sheltered from any storm as long as we listen to wisdom. And Father, I think a lot of wisdom is needed in uh, Christ's followers today. So Father, we want to have an ear that hears what the Spirit is saying. We want to have discernment. We want to understand what other people are saying, that by what they say, we know if they're for you or against you. We need just some common, practical things empowered by the supernatural power of the Holy Spirit so that we can turn things around in this nation, but also, Father, to get us out of our hot house mentality as believers where we're okay as long as we're within the four walls of the church, but man, when we step out, we're like deer caught in headlights. The ability to face problems and overcome them is a really a lacking situation in the body of Christ, but we are not victims. We're not the prisoner of anybody except for Jesus Christ. And so we're prisoners of hope, Father, expectation. Help us to present that picture of what it is to be truly a Christ follower who's a prisoner of hope, who can tell people it is going to get better. To make Him attractive, once again, to people, to sinners, Father, I ask that you help us do that. To be people of generosity, but not socialism, not wealth distribution. People that are willing to listen to offer solutions, not just, I'll pray for you. Father, we want to put our uh, money where our mouth is. We want to put feet to what we believe. And I believe all of us in this room are doing that. We want to go to another level of that. And so, Father, this morning, we give our tithes to you, not under any law. The tithe was way before the law, according to the order of Melchizedek, in fact. But we don't give it under any obligation of the law. We give it as our, our pledge of loyalty to Jesus Christ, that He is the King of kings, Lord of lords. To Him belongs the glory of all the nations and the wealth. And Father, we ask that you take what we give. Give us wisdom on how to distribute it. And Father, I pray that you always keep us in a position to have first